was at Riverview Pizza Place yesterday. Okay. Got some delicious pizza. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Everybody doing good? Am I a little too uh, awake and uh, loud for some of you guys this morning? Yeah. No. Like no people might still be waking up. Wake up. We got an extra hour of sleep. Why would we be tired? Hey, I've been here 45 minutes. I'm ready to go. You know, I live in Tennessee and I get here before most of you guys. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> it said fried chicken and gravy and biscuits. Exactly. It's good to be home, though. That's what I say. Michigan still feels like home. I walked in the building this morning. I was like, oh, I'm home. Feels good to be home. Good to have you home. It's about the same as here right now. Um, but I think this upcoming week, there's going to be some like low 70s. But, uh, but last week, it was mostly 50s. You know, so it's kind of it's that weird time of year where it, start, you know, it starts to fluctuate. So, All right, let's open our Bibles this morning. Luke chapter 6. I think we're actually going to get out of Luke chapter 6. This week. Oh, come on, Dave. I mean, it's, it's only been about three weeks now, I think, but we've had some good conversations about Luke chapter 6, and we're going to continue that. Last week, uh, we're going to, uh, we're, when we finished off the lesson, um, we were talking about the good tree and the bad trees, and who are the trees, and what are the good fruits and the bad fruits, and we were looking at that. We talked about what Stephen had to say from probably two weeks ago when he mentioned, you know, but aren't we called to judge with righteous judgment? And I said, I'll get to that. And then we got to it last week. And so uh, so when we look at those various aspects of Scripture, we're going to pick up on that thought process here today because uh, I told you at the end of last week that we have more to talk about. So we're going to shut it down and we'll pick this back up. So here we are picking it back up. So in Luke chapter 6, if you open up your Bibles to verse 43, please. Luke chapter 6, verse 43. Good morning, everybody. Got some more people coming in, so we'll give them a second to get to their place. But Luke 6 and 43. So you remember, we're not going to read those passages, but that was where it starts, where it starts to transition to this idea of the good trees and the bad trees, and the good trees are known by their fruit. The bad trees are known by their fruit. We know that the, those are just uh, terms that we, the scriptures use, uh, figurative terms for uh, for uh, for individuals, we are known. They're known by their fruits, meaning good works, whether good or bad. Good fruit, bad fruit. Good works, bad works. And so after that, we started talking about um, in First Corinthians chapter five. Don't turn there because we already covered this last week. But in First Corinthians chapter five, verse nine through thirteen, we looked at how um, uh, Paul, when he was writing that letter to them, he says, "I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people." He says, but I did not mean at all with the immoral people of the world, because then you'd have to actually leave the world. And we're actually supposed to deal with the world, because how else can I ever take the word out and share it if I don't actually deal with the world? He says, so I didn't, he goes, I did not at all mean the people of the world. He says, but actually, in verse 11, he says, but actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother that was an immoral person. And so that's what Stephen was talking about, because we're supposed to judge with righteous judgment. But then where, who are we supposed to judge with righteous judgment? Is it the world, or is it, those, or, or is it brothers and sisters in Christ? Brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what the scriptures teach us. And I know that because in that same passage of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, who judges? God judges, and he judges them based on what standard? The standard of the New Testament, the new law, the perfect law of liberty. And so we have the perfect law of liberty to lead us in life and in godliness. And so that's what we were looking at last week, and I said we'd pick back up on this this week. And, you know, I really don't think enough Christians understand that, that concept that we were talking about at the end of last week's class, and that's why I said I want to pick back up this week, because... So many people are confused when it comes to when are we supposed to judge, how are we supposed to judge, who are we supposed to judge. And so remember, to those that are in the world, we don't play judge, jury, and executioner. That's not our job. Our job is to go and share the message of Jesus Christ, share the gospel message 
in love with gentleness and reverence. I've often said, if you're ever having a Bible conversation with somebody, and it begins to turn a little negative, or uh, emotions are starting to become heightened, stop. Literally, stop. Because nobody's going to hear what you have to say at that point, because now it's just, you're speaking over each other, or one, you know, one's not really listening anymore, they're only listening in order to respond, but they're not listening to understand, and there's a difference. And so, when you look at this, Remember, we are called as brothers and sisters of Christ to hold each other accountable to the Word of God. And why do we? Why do you think that is? A, uh, why do you think that is the case? Why does God have that in there? Yes, absolutely. We're supposed to rate. Rebecca says we're supposed to raise each other up. Encourage each other in the word and in, in life and in good works and good deeds. And so as we encourage one another, we encourage each other by holding each other accountable to the perfect law of liberty. The only law that we have that has the ability to save our souls. Because we know that every human being at the end of time is going to be judged. And how are they going to be judged? Based on what standard? Based on the standard of the New Testament. Based on the, God's standard. And that's why and Peter tells us, uh, it was a second Peter chapter one, verse three, he says, you have everything you need. He goes, I have given you everything you need for life and for godliness. Yeah. Well, what is he telling us there? You want to know how to be a good husband? Read the scriptures. The New Testament tells you exactly how you will be judged as a husband, as a father, as a mother, as a, uh, as a wife. Uh, as children, as just regular everyday citizens, we know that the word of God is going to judge all mankind in the end because are we not all God's creation? Yes. And so if we are God's creation, we know that this is the standard that we'll be judged by. And when we look at this, uh, then last week we started to talk about, uh, as we move through, uh, as we uh, go through this, last week then we looked at, okay, well, if we're supposed to judge one another in the church, how do we do that? Well, we know we went over Matthew 18 last week. And we said that if a brother sins against you, a brother or sister sins against you, go and speak to them about the, their fault, about the sin, about the transgression that was committed against you. It says go in private. Talk to your brother or sister in love with gentleness, right? With the, with the express purpose of what? What is the point of going to them? Restoration. Restoration. To get them to turn away from sin. To get them to turn away from the sin that could cause division between you and them. But then eventually it, it could spread because the Bible says a little leaven, meaning sin, leavens the whole lump. Doesn't sin have a way of, uh, of, of affecting other people? How many times have we sinned in our lives and it doesn't just affect the sinner? Are there, are there individuals and families uh, who, have, anybody ever grow up with uh, any addiction or anything in their families? Does that only affect the one who's addicted? No. No, that's sin. It has a way of affecting everybody that lives in the household. It has a, a way of affecting their co-workers and people of the world. Well, how does it affect people of the world? Well, I know the news talks about every day about drunk drivers getting in an accident. There was an NFL player that just was driving 150-some miles an hour in his, in his Corvette, drunk, twice the legal limit, and, and killed a woman, in, I think it was her dog or something. And it was just like, did that man sin? have consequences that affected other individuals? Yes, but you hear about that. There's over 10, 15,000 people every year that die because of the sin of drunkenness, right? And so we look at this, right? Sin has a way of leavening the whole lump. It has a way of affecting not only just the church, but it has a way of permeating out to where it affects all people. So we go to brothers and sisters one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. If that doesn't work, we take two or three witnesses. We take two or three more. Why? So that every word can be confirmed. There's no he said, she said, right? Why is that important? Has anybody ever lied? <laughs> Has anybody ever made false accusations? Anybody ever make false accusations against somebody? Have you ever heard a story like that? All the time, all the time it happens. That's why you take two or three witnesses. And then we look at if they don't listen to them, you take it to the church. And you hopefully, if they don't listen to the church, then if they don't, then it says they are to be like a heathen or a tax collector. But then, we, get to, we got to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. And there it says that we are commanded. It says, now we command you. Who's we? Paul and the Holy Spirit. Because he's being led by who? The Holy Spirit. He says, we command you, brethren, in the same 
uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, meaning in his authority, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life. What does it mean to lead an unruly life? In contrast to God's word. Um, uh, not according to the traditions which you received from us. And so you look at those passages, and all of these passages of Scripture are speaking in terms of how Christians are supposed to deal with other Christians. This isn't talking about how we're to deal with the people of the world. But, here's the but. We know God's holy standard. Knowing what God's standard is, and how we are to hold each other accountable to that standard because we are all bond servants. Who, who remembers what the, the, the term bond servant is? What is, what is? How is it defined? Voluntary a voluntary slavery. You guys have heard me say this so many times that if you're a member of the Lord's church, that you voluntarily gave yourself over to Christ. <clears throat> Nobody dunked you into the water against your own will. Nobody had you stand up and confess Christ as your Lord and Savior against your own will. You volunteered to do, you volunteered to do that. And so you've given your life over to Christ, and now you have to live and be reprimanded by the law of Christ. But now we take the, uh, the word of God out into the world. And so I go to those in the world because I know they're outside of Christ. They're living in sin, just like we live in sin, but now we have the blood of Christ that will continuously cleanse over us if we don't purposely live in sin. Remember Hebrews 10 and 26? Hebrews 10 and 26 says, if you, pur if you are purposeful in your sin, meaning you know the right thing, you know what the scriptures say, but you don't care, you're going to do it anyways, no longer then does the blood of Christ continue to cleanse over you, wash over you, to cleanse you, to make you righteous in God's eyes. And so then you're separated from God. So that's where all this comes in. But those who are outside of the body of Christ, we take the word to them in hopes. You plant the seed in hopes that it'll prick their hearts. And if it pricks their hearts, what's, what are, what, what's your hope that it'll do? They'll turn away from sin. Every time in the scriptures, when you go through the book of Acts and you look at uh, conversion, we, let's start with John. Let's start with John the Baptist, right? Uh, before uh, you get to Acts chapter 2. Did John, what was John preaching? A baptism of what? Repentance. Repentance. Why? Okay. So these are people who are outside of the body of Christ. And he's trying to get them to turn away from their sin. These are the Jews, because the message went first to the Jews. He's trying to get them to turn away from sin. So it's a baptism of repentance. Because if you don't repent of the sin, if you're actively living in sin and you don't repent, you can't be then washed with the blood of Christ. Oh, sure, you could go down in the baptistry, but it's not going to count because you're still living in sin. All you did was get wet. You actually have to remove the sin from your life. So if I'm, if I'm, if I'm in the sin of whatever you want it to be, uh, you actually have to stop and go the opposite direction, right? You have to stop the sin and turn away from the sin and start to live for who? Christ. For God. Look, you, you mentioned Hebrews 26, uh, yep. 10, 26. That is really an important verse. I'd like for you to spend just a moment on it because yeah. it's deadly serious. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. It's deadly serious. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's look at Hebrews 10 and 26 for a minute. All right. Hebrews 10, 26. Turn your Bibles there, please. And I want you to understand what this says, because it's so very important that we understand this. It says, for if, if we, who's we? Christians. For if we, Christians, go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for your sins. And then verse 27 says, which is just important, but a terrifying, a certain terrifying expectation of what? Judgment. And the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. The judgment and the fire is talking about hell. It's not talking about my judgment. It's talking about God's judgment, the ultimate judgment. Because every single day, you're going to hear this in my sermon this morning, did you know that 168,000 people die every single day around the world? I wonder how many of them thought they had more time. Dave, I, I just 
want to interject that Thursday night, a, a very good coworker where we uh, practice, we have like, we call ourselves the mustard seeds on Wednesday. Okay. And we meet at 12 o'clock. We do it, you know, by Skype. Yep. So I come to work Friday and there was a big announcement that Angela had passed away Thursday mm. night. See? So you see somebody Wednesday, Bible study. Thank God. I, I said to my boss, and you know, you're not, you're supposed to be politically correct, but I said, I know where she is. I know where she went. And my boss knew. She said, yes, she was in Bible study with you. So it was a very hard day Friday. But yeah. your words resonate with me when you say, when you leave here, <coughs> we don't know. Yeah. No one knows. So I just wanted to say that. And I, it was a very hard day Friday because Absolutely. thank God she knew Jesus and I know where she yeah. is. But her family and, you know, it's devastating. We, we just keep living our lives. But what you're saying, yeah. it happens. It happens every it single happens day. I'm sorry, day. I'm sorry for your loss there. Thank you. But we think about the sin, right? We think about life and how fragile life is. Mm -hmm. If you're uh, in law enforcement, if you're an EMT, if you're a firefighter, if you're a medical worker, you know, you see death on a regular basis. Yeah. And you really start to understand how fragile life really is. I hate watching the local news. I almost never watch the local news. You know why? Because it's absolutely depressing. Mm -hmm. Because all it is about the people who are victims of crimes and people who are murdered or, uh, uh, you know, have died in some forms of accidents and all, it's just so depressing. And too often I believe that we take life for granted because we don't understand that life is short. We don't understand that at any, most, at any moment you could get a, a terminal diagnosis. At any moment you could uh, be hit by a drunk driver or be involved in a carjacking, or whatever the case may be. I'm gonna fly back to Tennessee. I hope to make it. But last week I was watching a little bit of the national news. There was two plane crashes last week. Pretty sure they got on the plane thinking they're gonna to get to their destination. But it's not guaranteed. And I don't say that to you know, frighten people or anything else. It's just the truth. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. So you look, get back to this uh, passage of scripture. For if we go on sinning willfully, what do you think it means by willfully? Don't try to change. Knowing that it's wrong, you decide to do it anyway. Knowing it's wrong, but you do it anyways. Should you expect, according to 26 and 27, I'm going to read it again and then ask yourself, should you expect God's grace and mercy if you're the person of 26 and 27? For if we go on, if I as a Christian go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for my sins, but a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversary. Who's the adversary? The sinner becomes the adversary of a holy and righteous God. And you're not going to receive his, uh, his grace and his mercy because you willfully have removed yourself from his grace and his mercy. Did you have Anna? No. Okay. So any questions on that? Is that pretty clear? Is it fair? Huh? Is it fair? That's a great question. Man, I love that question. Why do you guys think I would love that question? It gives you an opportunity to explain. <laughs> <laughs> he has no respect for Jesus, so it's his law or nothing. Yes, absolutely. We ask the question, as, as he just says, is that fair? And I love that because how many people want to blame God for the loss of a loved one? How many people want to blame God for all the problems in their life, the problems in their families, the problems in their marriages? They want to blame God for lots of different reasons. And yet, they openly sin on a regular basis. And so... We look at the scriptures here this morning, and we're going to get back to Luke chapter 6 now. But when you look at the scriptures, I, I, now we're going to move on here because I want you to see how all this comes full circle. So now we're back in Luke chapter 6. Please turn back to Luke chapter 6. And I want you to look at verse 46 now. Because verse 46 really truly sums this all up. Because this is Jesus speaking, right? Remember, I said, I, I used the term bondservant earlier. The bondservant who is somebody who voluntarily puts themselves in service to another. And then you get to Luke 6 and 46, and it says this. Why do you call me what? Lord. Lord. You know what the word Lord is also defined as? Master. Why do you call me Master 
master-servant relationship? Why do you call me Lord or Master and you don't do the things that I ask you to do? When you don't do what I tell you to do. If you're in a servant-master relationship, think about all times, right? You know, slavery wasn't just exclusive to the United States, right? All throughout the human history, slavery has been in existence since the beginning of time. And what happens when the slave or the servant is disobedient to the master? There's punishment. We are in a servant-master relationship. So in this whole conversation this morning, what happens when we, the servants, are disobedient to the master? What do we just read in 26 and 27 of Hebrews chapter 10? You should expect a terrifying uh, 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 expectation of judgment. Does this all make sense? How many opinions did I just give you in the last, in my opening uh, dialogue here? How many opinions? Where did all this information come from? Right in the Bible. So am I making this stuff up? No. This is what it says. And so Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? And I love that passage of scripture there because the whole point of it is it's supposed to prick your heart. There's a verse, I'm not sure where, but it says, don't fear the one that can hurt your body. Yes, absolutely. The gospel tells us, Jesus says, don't fear those who all they can do is kill the body physically, but fear the one who can cast body and soul into hell. Who's that? God. And so, you look at the scriptures this morning. We get to verse 47. Notice what this says. When you read verse 47 through 49, I want you to ask yourself if you are the person of verse 47 through 49. Everyone who comes to me, who? Jesus. And hears my words and acts on them, meaning who obeys them, I show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built his house on the ground without any foundation. The torrent burst against that house and immediately it collapsed. And the ruin of that house was great. Man, it feels good. We got through chapter 6. But we look at this information here this morning, and I want you to ask yourself, is your faith built on Jesus as your foundation? Let me ask it another way. How much of what you believe is based on popular Christian opinion versus how much of what you believe is based on Holy Writ, God's instruction manual? Do we have a lot of denominations in the world? Do we even have the Brothers in Christ, Church of Christ members who have gone astray? Churches of Christ, whole churches who have uh, gone into the ways of denominationalism, adding and subtracting from what the Word actually teaches? Absolutely. My question for you is this. Is your faith founded on Jesus Christ and He and His teachings as the foundation, or is it founded on popular opinion of Christianity or Christian dumb. Yes. I was raised in Church of Christ, right? Uh -huh. And from until I got to be an adult, I didn't find myself until from, from the beginning it was just, oh, my parents had me go to church. Yeah. They had me go to church. Until I grew up and things happened, that's when I found myself. You know, and people have to come to that realization that it's not just what your parents teach you or your your religion is not your parents. Your faith is not your parents' faith. Yeah. Your faith is your own. Absolutely. So finding my own faith brought it a lot, made things a lot easier for me. Yes, absolutely. And what Sonia just said, for those of you who didn't hear, she said she grew up in the Lord's Church. But when she grew up in the Lord's Church, she just had uh, Lewis and Butchie's faith. She didn't know what she didn't really know. She hasn't experienced life yet. And, but as she grew, and as she grew into adulthood, she then started to understand 
because she's maturing in life and in, in spirit as to what the scriptures teach, how it affects her life, and really that she needed to have her own faith. I preach sermons and I've done uh, Bible classes. I have actually challenged, and I know it's probably weird for like a minister in the Lord's Church to challenge people to question their faith, but when I've talked to teens, I've actually tell them to question their faith. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Is there a God? And how can I know? Was Jesus a real person of history? How could I know? Did he do the things that are attributed to him? And can I know? Why is that important to answer those questions? Separate and apart from what your parents tell you? Because you're building your own foundation. And if you're building it on the word of God, then you're building your foundation of your faith on Jesus Christ and him as the chief cornerstone. Is that biblical? Yes. And so I've often said the reason why so many of the members of the Lord's Church, when they become, they start to enter into early adulthood, meaning they graduate high school and they go off to college, what happens? They begin to meet all various people of different world religions, different backgrounds, different denominations, and they start to build friendships and they start to uh, have, you know, just some, you know, eventually start to have uh, uh, conversations about each other's background and their beliefs and their faith. And if you don't have a foundation on Christ, then you could speak to a Muslim and they could be, they could have a strong foundation in their beliefs. And then you could hear what you, uh, what they say. And you say, you know, I, I can see that. That kind of makes sense. Well, why would you ever say that? Because you don't even really know why you believe what you believe. You just know you went to church on Wednesday and Sunday because that's what your parents did. So you don't have your own faith, you have your parents' faith. And so then you go off into the world, you go off into college and, 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 and beyond, and you start to meet all these different people of the world, and then you start to you be so confused because you meet this person, you'd be like, I can see that. Oh, a Hindu, that kind of makes sense. Uh, oh, a Baptist or Lutheran, oh, that kind of makes sense. And you're so confused. And did you know that like 60-some percent of the kids that go off from the Lord's Church don't end up returning to the Lord's Church? Why? Because they never learn to have their own faith. Rebecca. The biggest thing I've heard from all ages is, oh, you have your own truth. Yes. That's like the biggest thing. Yeah. They're like, oh, well, that, just, that justifies my truth, is that it's true to me. Yeah. It's, yeah, you have your own truth, right? Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Pilot to Jesus, what is truth? Pilot to Jesus, what is truth? That's a good question. And so I encourage uh, young and, and old alike in the church to, to, if you've never studied out why you believe what you believe, ask questions. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Search for the truth. Because if you put in the sweat equity, guess what's going to happen? You're going to see the truth, and the truth is going to set you free. Free from the bondage of all those other false teachings. <clears throat> Because you've put in the time and effort to find the truth. We teach this wonderful little song about the wise man who built this house. We teach it our kids. Right? Yeah. And that's wonderful. It tells the story of a foolish man and a smart man. Yeah. But what we don't teach in that story is that both of them had the truth at the beginning. Yes. As the scripture said, I will show you what he is like a man who comes to me and hears my word. Mm -hmm. So these men knew mm -hmm. how to build correct home. Yeah. They had the truth. Yeah. One chose to build it on the sand and yep. other on the foundation of good standards. Absolutely. That, and how do we impress that upon our kids and say, okay, it's just not any truth. Yeah. It is the truth. The truth. Absolutely. And so at the end of the day, Jesus said we could come to know the truth. Amen? But we could only come to know the truth if you put in the sweat equity. Meaning you actually have to spend some time researching, studying, looking into all the various things. And guess what? There's lots of information outside of the book we call the Bible that confirms the message of the Bible. But you have to search those things out. You have to look for them. That's why you look at all the atheists over time who've spent years of their lives trying to disprove this thing called Christianity only to turn around and give their lives to Christ. Why? Because around every corner, they, 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 they get to a point where I can no longer deny 
the information and how it confirms what the Bible teaches. People who were enemies of Christianity and in their writings, they never denied that Jesus existed. They didn't deny that he was crucified in, in the events that happened on the cross, the darkness that fell over the land, the earthquakes, uh, the things that happened in the temple. No, they were trying to explain them away, which proves what? Jesus was a real person of history because even the enemies of Jesus wrote about the things that happened. Even the enemy, Jesus, enemies of Jesus wrote about the miracles. They were just trying to figure out ways to explain why these things, uh, why he was uh, just maybe some prophet. They were trying to figure out ways to explain why these things maybe not, might not be true. And so, we, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole today on apologetics, but there is a ton of information out there that we can, if we want to spend the time, come to know the truth. We get to chapter 7 here this morning. Yes, finally. It's only been three and a half weeks in chapter 6. And in chapter 7, we say in verse 1 and 2, When he, Jesus, had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And at Capernaum, uh, there was a, a centurion slave who was highly regarded uh, by him, uh, by him was sick, about to die. When you look at those first two verses, a centurion was normally a, a Roman military leader, a commander who was in charge of a hundred individuals. A century, a centurion, 100 people, 100 years. And so it's clear, what is clear though about this individual, and that's interesting about this story, is that he was a Gentile. Why is that important? Because who came to Jesus, as we read through this, if you, if you know the story, who came to Jesus pleading on this man's behalf? The Gent or the Jews. And the Jews normally would have nothing to do with Gentiles. But we read on in verse 3 through 5. When he heard about Jesus, the centurion, he sent some Jewish elders. The centurion sent Jewish elders. And asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly, the Jews, earnestly implored him, saying, Is he, wor uh, he is worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation. And it was he who built our synagogue. So when you look at those first five verses, we know that he was a man who feared God. And he was a man uh, who was a Gentile. But yet he probably worshipped the God of Israel, respected the people of Israel. Because were God's people supposed to be different and set apart in the Old Testament from all the other pagan nations that they dealt with? Now, if you are in a pagan nation worshiping all these pagan gods with their children, sac their child sacrifice and their uh, sexual immorality with temple priests and priestesses and all the everything that went on into pagan worship. And then you see these people who are set apart. Were they perfect? By no means. Jesus called many of the leaders of the Jews hypocrites. But we understand that, but many of the Jews, they tried to live the best they could according to the law, of, uh, according to the old law. And so you look at that, and we see that in these verses that uh, it's very comparable to Acts chapter 10 when you read the story about Cornelius. How the Jews came, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, or the Holy Spirit came to Peter, who was, uh, who was uh, me meditating and in prayer, and uh, he received a vision that he was supposed to go to Cornelius, and it was at that time, 10 years after the church started in Acts chapter 10, that God, through the Holy Spirit, sent um, Corn uh, servants of Cornelius's to Peter, and to bring him back, in order to do what? To preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so my point is, you look at this, neither Cornelius and or this individual doesn't ever say they were a proselyte, which means they were still what? Gentiles, outside of Judaism. What's a proselyte? Somebody who was a pagan, right, a Gentile, who then uh, went through the rites in order to become, through the Jewish uh, uh, rites uh, of, of cleansing, in order to become a member of Judaism. They weren't a member of the full, uh, a full member of the nation, because even them, even the proselytes had certain areas that they couldn't go into in the temple. And so, but we look at all this and we understand that the centurion could probably recognize the difference 
between the Roman citizens who worshipped all types of man-made gods with all the foolishness of their worship versus a holy nation. Were they supposed to be a holy nation, the Jews? A people for God's own possession? Right? Were they supposed to live uh, separate and apart from the rest of society? So then this man, if he's seeing Jews living a holy life, a righteous life, that should stand out in contrast to what we know through history, how the Romans lived. With the, all the sin that was in, the torturous executions, and the, and the, and the sexual immorality, and all the sin that was, that was taking place in their society. It kind of makes me think of going back in the Old Testament. Anybody remember Ruth and Naomi? <coughs> This story kind of makes me think of uh, Ruth and Naomi. Because Ruth, or Naomi, tried to send uh, Ruth, uh, and I can't remember the other lady's name. But anyways, he tried, she, she, Naomi said, hey, husbands are gone. I have no other sons. Surely if I have more children, if I had a husband, you're not going to wait until they grow up. And she tries to send them home. Go back to your mothers. Go back to your own families. Go back to the gods of your youth. For I have nothing I could give you. And one left, and one stayed. And I like to think that, uh, that Ruth saw in Naomi a God-fearing, righteous woman. Because if she was to go back to her parents, go back to the people of her youth, go back to the gods of her youth, did you know the gods of her youth were involved in all types of like, uh, child sacrifice and all types of sexual immorality and everything else as a part of their religious or a part of their religion. And so she could probably see the difference in a holy and righteous God in Naomi who was living according to God's standard versus if she would have went back home to live back amongst a pagan nation and pagan gods and all that that entailed. Turn over for me for a second to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. And then we're going to look at a passage in chapter 3 of 1 Peter. Because you have, to, you have to look at this. Because the same information that was given to the people of the Old, uh, of the Old Testament, the, the Jews of the Old Law, is given to God's people of the New Testament, Christians. And notice what it says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says this. But you, who's you? Christians. But you, Christians, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. What does it mean to be holy? Set apart. It means you ain't supposed to look like the world. You're not supposed to act like the world, talk like the world, entertain yourself like the world. You're supposed to be holy, set apart. And it says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That same information was given to God's people of the Old Testament. They too were supposed to be that. So I like to think that Ruth saw in Naomi a holy and righteous woman who was set apart from the pagans in which they lived amongst. Because remember, in the story of Ruth and Naomi, that uh, uh, I think it was uh, her husband, uh, was it Elimelech? I think uh, took them and then went into, because there was a famine, and left, the, uh, left the, uh, the place where they lived, and then they went to live amongst the Moabites, a pagan nation, and they were surrounded by evil and sin and paganism. And yet she wanted to follow Naomi, because I like to believe that she, would, she set the example that we as Christians are to set in the world. Why do you think I said a couple of weeks, through two, three weeks ago when I was preaching a sermon about be careful how you live because you may, your life may be the only Bible that somebody ever reads? Because you are supposed to live out your faith. Me and Tony, when we go out into the world, whether we go to work or whether we are amongst friends who are outside of the church or family members who are outside of the church, we are to conduct ourselves in a certain manner as to eventually, hopefully, they're going to want to know about our God because there's something different about us. And so now we look at the next passage of Scripture. Stay in 1 Peter chapter 3 now. Notice what it says, verse 8 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 through 12. Still talking to Christians here. 
It says, to sum up, all of you, who? Christians. All of you Christians are to be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirits, not returning evil for evil, meaning sin for sin, not returning insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. In verse 10 now, notice what it says. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must, is that a suggestion when it says must? No, it's a command. Must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil, meaning sin, and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. Oh, but pay attention. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what? Evil. Evil, which is sin. If you're living in sin, and you, remember Hebrews 10, 26, 27? If you're practicing sin, willfully in sin, the blood of Christ no longer covers you. The ears of, uh, of the Lord no longer attend to your prayers. Why? Because you're no longer in a safe state. Because you understand the will of God, you know the word of God, and you do the opposite anyways. Because you're not living for God. You're living for your own. Sins of the flesh. Your own desires of the flesh. Does that make sense? Any thoughts, comments on this? Jim. You know, I, was, I was kind of thinking about that as you were describing the idea of repentance. When we come in our sinful state, we come with both sin and with guilt. Yeah. When we repent and come to Christ, he takes away the guilt. Yes. But he expects us to take away the sin. Absolutely. Absolutely. He takes away the consequences of the sin, but we actually have to take away the sin. Because that's what repentance is. You come to realize, listen, when you go in the baptistry, there ain't a person I've ever met who understands the complete uh, oracles of God. But as you grow and as you learn the will of God, as you read the New Testament for yourself, and you realize, oh, you come to that crossroads in life because you're reading and you said, oh boy. Because that's me he's talking about. I told you guys, when I first came to the Lord's Church, for a year and a half, two years, I used to sit in the pew just like you, and I listened to Tad preach over at Sunset and Taylor when he was there, and every single week, I was just, it's like he's talking about me. Anybody ever sit in the pews and hear a message from the Word of God and say, yep, he's talking about me this week? I hope so. It lasted, it, it did that to me for a year and a half, two years. And it always stuck in my mind because I remember as I was growing and maturing and turning away from sin in, the, in those two years, I remember one Sunday, specific Sunday morning. I was sitting there next to Christy, and I was about three quarters, he's probably halfway, three quarters away through the sermon. I nudged my wife. I said, he ain't talking about me this week. <laughs> but I was happy because it took a long time before he wasn't talking about me. But what happened? I was applying the word of God to my life. When I came to those crossroads of faith, meaning that you learn something new, you realize it's talking about you because those are the things that you do, you have a choice to make. I'm either going to live for God or I'm going to live for Dave. I'm either going to live for God or I'm going to live for myself. And that's what Hebrews 10 and 26 and 27 are saying. If you choose God... You're continuously cleansed by the blood of Christ. If you choose yourself, you no longer are cleansed by the blood of Christ. Does that make sense? Because you openly know the truth and you reject it. Hebrews 4.12 was written to Christians, but it applies to non-Christians as well. Yes. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Amen. Amen. There's nothing that we're going to do, we're going to end it on that. There's nothing that we could do in this life that the God, our, our, our God and Father doesn't know about. Because he knows all things. And so, you may fool family members, you may even fool the church, and your shepherds, your elders, leaders of the congregation. But you know who you're never going to fool? God. Let's go to God of Prayer. Oh. Her name is Opa. O-R-P-A. Orpa. Yeah, yeah. 
I could, it's one of those weird names. I just couldn't remember what it was. Let's go to God in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your great many wonderful blessings. Father, we thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior, for the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures that lead us in life and godliness. Father, as we enter into worship to you here this morning, I pray that we set aside the cares uh, of the world and that we focus in. Uh, and as we all collectively worship you, for there's an audience of one. And Father God, I just pray that our worship is acceptable in your sight. I pray, Father God, that when we leave this building today, we understand that we're going out into the mission field of the world and that we're, uh, that we're cognizant of how we live our lives and, and the things that we project to those that are in the world. I pray, Father God, that we could bring glory and honor to you for all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, brethren.